Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our midweek service. So glad to have you guys with us tonight. Caught me off guard there. I thought I had a little bit more time than I did, but I did not. So either way, the show must go on. So I'm so glad to have you guys here. We are in our series titled Spirit Filled. Last week, we kind of took a dive into what does it look like to live a spirit-filled life, and we looked at the life of Jesus, who operated in his ministry in his time here on earth, uh, fully man, surrendering his divinity, but still being God, but walking in the spirit, and showing us that there's a way that it can be done, uh, because he did not walk with the same authority that he has now in heaven. It's Bible says that he laid his divinity down. He took a lesser role. He humbled himself so that he can walk this earth full of the spirit. And we looked at his life from the moment of the birth of his ministry, when he was baptized by John, when he went into the wilderness and when he came out full of the spirit. And the first thing he does is he walks into the synagogue and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah where he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring the good news to set the captives free, and he goes on to say, and he lives out this life, he has these 12 disciples where he lives and models this before them, and then before he ascends back up to heaven, he tells them specifically, listen, we're gonna do this great big thing here, man, we're gonna change the world, we're gonna flip this thing upside down, but before we do that, I need you guys to do me a solid, I need y'all to go to Jerusalem and wait there, And he says, and tarry. And this was important that they sat there and waited for the instructions. But more importantly, they waited for the promise of the Holy Spirit to come. Because what they were going to do required the power of the Holy Spirit. And many of us know that we can do things in our own strength, in our own might. Some of us are very talented in certain areas. We're gifted. But there's something that when you have the power of God, the Holy Spirit propelling you into the ministry, into the giftings that you have. It takes uh, the natural to the supernatural. And that's what these gentlemen did. These were ordinary fishermen, tax collectors, physicians, just normal guys. But when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they were endued with power, the Bible says. And when they preached, they preached with boldness. And when the people heard these words, they were... They were, they were hearing these words for the first time that were bringing life. And life was changing. The church was being built up. It was growing. And the first message that Peter brings, the same guy who denied Jesus just three times earlier, is now full with the Spirit. And 3,000 are saved. And, you know, we know the story. They were filled with the Spirit. They spoke in tongues. Those who were there worshiping in Jerusalem heard them speaking in their native tongues. And then we see throughout the scriptures there, especially through the book of Acts, that uh, many were being given this power and they were beginning to do extraordinary things tongues prophecy healings all of these things were manifesting through the power of the holy spirit and we ask ourselves is that for today and that was the posing question that i had last week and i said yes we believe in that i believe that these gifts are here for us today now the question is why are we not seeing the church operating in the way that it should in the divine design that god has given us And I hope that tonight, as we are continuing, this is really more of a part two from last week. This was a really dense message, and I had to break it up into two parts. But I'm hoping that tonight we can begin to unpack our divine design and experience with hopefully helping us understand what our giftings are and how to begin to use them. Because I believe that when we develop our gifts and we use them properly, we see the ministry grow. We see the church grow. And I don't mean just ministry, like local ministry. I mean like the ministry of Christ being grown in the world. We're seeing people walking out their purpose in life. And that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to speak about uh, gifts today. But uh, before I talk about how we operate in these gifts, I want to kind of help you understand this. Tonight's theme is, is kind of getting gifts versus using gifts, okay? Because I know all of us want to get to the part where, Pastor, how am I going to use this gift, right? I want to be able to start doing things for Jesus, of course, right? Um, We say that, but oftentimes we want them because we just want to have them so we can flex a little bit. And God, really, I want to caution you that we don't walk in that kind of arrogance because I, in the beginning, there was a time where I'm like, I want this gift, but my heart wasn't right. My heart wasn't right because I wanted it just so that I can brag and walk around saying, look at me, I got this gift. And it wasn't the right heart posture. And I think that's why God delayed and giving me it. And when he finally gave it to me, I understood what this gift does. And that's what we're going to talk about. Just like in Christmas time, your kids may want a gift. Or you, if you're a child in this place and there's a certain gift you want, you understand that I can give you a gift 
But if it's a gift that needs to be assembled and you don't read the directions, you're going to have a hard time putting that gift together and use it. And I've seen this many times at Christmas time. My kids will ask for certain gifts and they'll open it up. How many of you guys know? And they'll play with it for like five or six minutes, but they don't get the full enjoyment out of it either. They don't have the batteries or they didn't put it back together. And they're just like, oh, I don't want this toy. And they move on to something else. When in reality, this is something they wanted, but it's because they didn't take the time to either read or they didn't take the time to follow the instructions and put the batteries in and really use it the way it was intended to be used that they lose interest in it. And this is what can happen sometimes with church. We can ask for a gift, but if we don't know how to use it, we can abuse it. And then we kind of don't use it the way it was intended. So tonight, I want to really help us to understand how we step into these gifts because these gifts are not for ourselves, but it's for others. I'm going to say that again. These gifts are not for us, but they are for others. And I want to get into tonight's scripture. We're going to be uh, hanging out in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to jump into 13 and we're going to jump into 14. Uh, like I said last week, look, think of it as a sandwich, right? You know, you have your bread, your meat in the middle, and then you have your other piece of bread, right? Like the sandwich, you, you, that's, you need all the parts of it to make it a sandwich. You can't have the top part of the bread and the meat and not have the bottom part. Or you can't have the two pieces of bread without the meat in the middle. I believe that 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 are like that. The 12 and 14 are like your sandwich ends, which tell you the giftings and how they work. But 13 is that meat that really tells you why that gift is there and how we use that gift and why it's developed. So this is what we're going to look at here. But Paul starts off in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, by saying this to the church. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers... I do not want you to be uninformed. I don't want you to not know what is coming with this. I don't want you to be ignorant to these things. He's telling them, I want you to be informed. And as your pastor tonight, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be misinformed or uninformed. But God wants you to know that there are gifts for you. He wants to help you develop these gifts so that you can in turn help others to fall into their divine design. Because God has created each and every one of us with a purpose. And the first thing we need to understand first is discovering what our unique gifts are. Because God has gifts for each and every one of us. The fact that you are here today, you've received the best gift ever, the gift of salvation. I think sometimes we don't think about that as a gift because we have been walking with the Lord so long that we take it for granted. It's just like, you know, uh, it's almost like you're entitled to something, but you're not, we're not entitled to anything. The Bible says we were enemies of God, but because he loved us and he was so rich in mercy, he gave himself as a ransom to pay the debt that you and I couldn't pay. I think if we really were to actually see the debt that was owed, we would know that, man, there's nothing I could ever do. No matter how many good deeds, you can never get the favor and the mercy of God. That's why it's called grace. It's called, uh, grace is something that we don't deserve. It's an unmerited, it's unmerited favor. And that's what we've been given. So knowing that we have the gift of salvation, can you just say you've received the gift already? All right, maybe you don't have all these other gifts that are outward of prophesying, speaking in tongues, laying of hands, gift of encouragement, administrative, whatever gifts that they, the, the Bible lists here, you at least have that gift. But God does give us more gifts. And the thing is, each one of our gifts are unique to us. They're not unique to God, but they're unique to us. And each one of you guys have something right now that you're good at, you're gifted at. And I don't know what that is. Maybe it's the gift of speech. Maybe it's the gift of art, arts and our art, art singing, right? How many of you guys can sing? I can sing. I can make a joyful noise. And we're going to get into that in just a moment here, all right? But... You know, maybe you can draw, maybe you're an encourager, maybe you're somebody who, when you're going down and you're feeling like, ah, oh, man, and, and I know who to go to that's going to lift me up because you have the gift of encouragement. Every one of us has something that we naturally operate in and God gives us a supernatural to that. And the thing is, those gifts that we have, we have to ask God, what is it that I'm good at? What is it that people normally come to me for? Ask yourself those questions. When folks are coming to me, what do they normally come to you for? Now, if you're a parent, your kids are probably coming to you asking you for money all the time. Look, I'm not saying you have the gift of giving. (laughs) I think we all do at that point. But there is gifts that we have. And I want you to think about your friends, those who you work with. What are you known for to them? And that's something that you have to ask God. God, is this a gift that we see listed in Scripture that you can put your super to this natural? That we can do something to build the kingdom of God. 
Because if people are naturally coming to you for these things, it gives you the opportunity to share the gospel. And then you have to ask yourself, how has God used me in this already? Because he's probably already used you and you haven't even realized he's used you because you don't really think about giving him the credit for it. But if you think about opportunities that have come up in your life, that you've been able to not only help somebody, minister to somebody or bless somebody, and now you see their lives slowly changing and coming closer to Christ. God has used you already. And maybe you didn't attribute it to a gift, but you need to see what that is and say, Lord, is this a gift that you have given me? And can I use this for others? Another thing you need to ask yourself to discover what your gift is, is what am I passionate about? I think sometimes we don't think that even our passions and our desires could be used to bring glory to God. But it's our desires, if they line up with God's heart and his desires, are what we can become passionate about. And that's the thing, our passions to serve others, to bless others, to have others experience the goodness, not even of God, even if it's just, like I said, arts and music and different things, or maybe you're somebody who's handy and you just, when when something breaks, you're like, I got you, what do you need? Let me fix your roof or let me fix whatever. I know a few people in here that if, if something breaks, I can call them and I know they'll be there. Because they just have that gift and that passion of helping others. And what brings you joy? Because everything that we do for the Lord should bring us joy. If it's a burden, and when you see that phone call, somebody who you know, if you pick up this phone, it's going to be at least three-hour conversation, and you're like, oh, I just don't want to. It doesn't bring you joy. Maybe you don't have the gift of encouragement. <laughs> right? But if you're one where you see that phone call and you pick up with somebody and you just talk for four or five hours and time goes by and they feel so much better and yet you feel like you didn't give them anything, like I didn't even say anything, but just sitting there listening to them and that brought you joy, look, God can use that. And this is what we need to understand how we learn to use those gifts. Now, this is where I want to kind of talk to you about using our gifts and what they are for. Because uh, my wife and I, (laughs) we've been married a long time. And we've gotten to know each other. I understand what her giftings are. I understand what she's strong at and where I'm strong at. And we are in two different places. Elizabeth has this great gift of discerning certain things, of, of God giving her warnings for people. And if they heed to these warnings, oftentimes good things happen. When they don't heed the warnings, we, we see what happens. And I have the gifting of more of knowledge and teaching. And I love to learn. I love the things of God. I love teaching the word of God. Very different. But these giftings are definitely important and needed in the body of Christ. But now we have these children. And you know how we've been going through this series on Sundays about learning our personality types. And we've taken the time to discover each and every one of our personalities in our house. And we realized that out of the nine different personalities, we have six. Maybe five, because we were just talking last night about the little one. And we were like, what, what do you think she is? And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I have my ideas and my thoughts on what she might be. But what I do know is that she's beautifully and wonderfully made by the Lord. I'm not going to put her in a box, but I understand that she does have some qualities that I'm like, if they're not developed, can be toxic. Can I get an amen? Some of my kids in here, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? But if they are developed, man, these are gifts that will bring such a joy and a blessing to all who know her, and even including my kids. And this is something that we have to understand. And and during our time of getting in the word, I can see how God is using each and every one of them. My kids do a Friday night Bible study. And when I sit back and I watch how the Lord uses them in that time, they're very different. My son, the way he is, he knows exactly when to throw a little humor in when things seem a little tense or seem a little dry. And it just brings life to the group. You know, Mia is one who's very studious and very detail-oriented. And when you look at her, no, she's got post-its all in there. And she's like, we're going to stick to this right here, okay? Let's get to the plan here. And then Abby is just very, um, what should I say about Abby? Abby's the glue that holds them all together, okay? Because Isaac's on one end, Mia's over here, and Abby's like, she could be the one that's going to be like, man, something will come out of her mouth, and you're like, who is this child? And then if something else can come out of his mouth, like, whose child is this, <laughs> right? But either way, it still allows these kids to understand that there's no doubt she loves the Lord. There's no doubt she loves what she's doing and how much she cares for these kids. And I've seen each and every one of them grow. And they're growing into their calling and their giftings. And nor am I saying because I'm a pastor, you guys have to be pastors. You know, because I'm not a worship leader, but my daughter can sing. 
And, and part of me feels like, well, if she can sing, it's because she got it from somebody. So it had to be from me, right? I got this gift, Lord. Like, can you, can you let me do this? But no, we all have different gifts. And as we begin to dis- determine what these giftings are, it's up to me as a parent to develop those gifts in them. The same goes for you. What your giftings are, what you're naturally good at, God will use that to propel you to build the kingdom of God. And you need to develop that. You need to grow in that. And the best way to do that is by serving. Because you'll find out exactly where your strengths are when you serve others. Remember we talked about Jesus. When he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he didn't go in and how everyone served him. He went out and began to serve others and minister to some others and, and meet their needs where they were. And this is important because when you begin to serve, and this is what's important for me when I started walking with the Lord, I jumped in. And I said, Lord, I don't know exactly what my gifts are, but I'm, any opportunity that I see, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to just do it. And we say that to you, not just to serve here, but just serve in general, serve others in any capacity you can. We have plenty of opportunities for you here, by the way, at this church. And if you don't like one place, we'll find another spot for you until you find your place. But when you begin to serve others, there's going to be something that just naturally rises to the top and God begins to use that. And that's what Paul was saying to these churches here. He's saying, hey, I don't want you to be misinformed because what we need to understand, number one, is that God creates Satan counterfeits. You know, I've seen videos of people who don't serve our God, who serve pagan gods and idols, and I've seen them being healed by praying to those idols. So I know that there's demonic forces and the devil can manifest what looks to be healings, but it's not truly healing. What it is, he's been holding these people in such bondage, but because he wants to keep you away from the true Lord, the true God, they can pray to him and he'll release some of that bondage for a moment and they will look like what they're receiving is healing. And in reality, it's just him letting them go from the bondage that he's been holding them in because he's the one who comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. He's the one who's the author of sickness and confusion. It's him who does this. So we need to be careful because you've seen others lay hands and pray in other names of God's and receive manifestations and healings. Doesn't necessarily mean it's of God because God is the one who creates and Satan counterfeits. And Paul warns this church, and look at what he says here in the second verse. He says, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except the Holy Spirit. And this is where I want to caution you. Because you can see a lot of things that may seem like it's of God, but it's not. And we need to be careful. That's why the Bible says that we need to... Test every spirit. Be discerning. Because there may be some that even may come, quote unquote, in the name of the Lord. But remember, he says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Demons screech and run at the sight in the name of Jesus. So we need to be careful because we can get to this place where we think that we're walking with God and we could be entertaining mute and idle spirits. And this is where we need to caution ourselves and making sure that what we're doing is serving and promoting the kingdom of God and not ourselves. Because these idols will want you to be glorified, will want you to walk around with the sense of entitlement and arrogance because you have a certain gift that someone else doesn't have. And because they don't have it, they're a JV Christian versus you. You're on the varsity team. And you got something you have to offer that no one else has. And this is where we have to be careful because Satan wants to counterfeit. He wants to do anti-ministry. And that's why when we read in the scriptures, when you say, well, Lord, Lord, I cast out demons in your name. I did all these things. And Jesus says, depart from me for I never knew you. Why? Because they were operating in what they thought was the spirit of God. And in reality, it was a spirit of the antichrist. So we need to be careful. And then Paul goes on, and this is how he helps us. He goes on to talk about our physical bodies in comparison to the church. And all of us know our bodies are very unique. We know when our bodies are a little off. Like before I walked onto this stage, I wasn't feeling the best. And I don't know if it's the allergies or the weather change, and I just felt lethargic. I felt weak. And you know when you start to feel like you're going under, and you're like, I got to start taking something. I got to start praying. I got to start anointing the oil and doing all that kind of good stuff because I know I'm just not right. 
You know, and, it's, and you know when your body's not right. And what do you do? You quickly attack whatever that is because you want to get it out so that you can walk in wholeness. And, and, and Paul begins to describe the physical body to the church. And look at what he says here in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 12. And this is important. He goes, just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. In other words, the way your body functions, the way it works, you don't want to lack anything within your body. You want everything to operate the way it was intended to operate. So when I almost lost my thumb, yeah, I felt kind of bad because I'm like, "Ah, can you imagine me going around with nine fingers trying to do things? It just wouldn't work. I would make it work, but it's not the way it was intended. And that's the same for the body of Christ. When we have unhealthy members within the body, it's not operating the way it needs to. Does the body operate? Yes, it operates as best as it can, but it's not operating to the full capacity because many of us are either don't know what our gifts are, we're not operating in them effectively, or we're operating in the spirit of antichrist, thinking that we're operating in the spirit of God and we're causing more destruction and confusion than we are unity in building of the kingdom of God. And this is what he's saying here. Verse 13, he says, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Not this church, not that church, not one body, one universal big C church. You might have smaller ministries, but those ministries are a part of the body. They're members that function in the way they need to function. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Verse 17, I'm gonna jump down a little bit. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smelling? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chooses. This is why the church down over here at the block, over here at Five Points, does ministry the way they do ministry. Because God has made them and arranged them to do what they do. That's why he arranged us the way he's arranged us versus the church that's down the street over here. Or the church that's over here, maybe two blocks. Because we got like four or five churches within this like two block radius. And you may think to yourself, man, what would happen if all these churches just came together? Uh, Yeah, we are one church all together. We're just arranged differently. Because God has raised up men to do specific tasks for the building of his church. So I'm not the pastor down there. Nor has he called me to be like the pastor down there. There's a congregation specifically for that pastor. He's a shepherd who was called to take care of a flock. I was a shepherd called to take care of a flock. Now, here's the thing. Within that flock, there are times where the sheep now become, uh, they begin to stand on two feet, and I need to see that in them, and instead of trying to hold them within the fold, I need to bless them because God is now developing their gifts to go out to be arranged to bless the body of Christ. See, sometimes when people leave church, it's not a bad thing. We always attribute it as a bad thing, but we don't realize sometimes God is calling us to something else. And we need to bless him because the body needs to be a healthy body. Because if I have somebody here who is as good in in preaching and teaching and does what I do, then man, wouldn't he be better served somewhere else doing what I'm doing rather than having to? And that's what we see in Acts chapter 13, right? We see all these different apostles coming together and like, hey, there's a church over there that needs a leader. How about you guys take some of these men and bring them over there instead of you five just hanging out here? And it's important that we understand these giftings, develop them so they can be sent out apostolically. See, when you have a good apostolic leader, he doesn't hold on to his position. He understands when others are rising up and he blesses them and sends them out. And that's what I love about Pastor Pastor Craig. He operates in the apostolic gifting. You know, it's like planting and seeing visions in churches and lifting them up and finding men there, developing them and sending them off. And that's why I'm here and he's where he's at. He doesn't have to be here holding on to it because he knows that there's a gifting here and he has confidence that I'm going to do what God has called me to do here. And I'm not going to go sideways and lead you guys astray. And this is what Paul is talking about here. It's that interdependency that we have within one another. We're not lone rangers. I celebrate when this church does good things. I celebrate when that church over there does good things. Why? Because the church overall is growing and moving forward. And this is where we go from Christian ministry versus Christian maturity. See, Christian ministry means I want to pack this place up and I want to build this empire for myself. And everybody that comes in here, it's a numbers game. And I want to have the biggest church and I want to go be called to speak at the conferences and I want to be seen, you know, over here and over there with the mayor and this city council. I don't need all of that. 
There might have been a time when I was a young pastor, though. I'm going to tell you right now, when I took over Newport News and there was 20 people there, I was like, what in the ham sandwich is this? There is 12 people here, 20 if you count my family, and some of you guys who came from Norfolk up there with me. Um, bless your heart. Thank you so much because you guys encouraged me driving up there with us. But I was like, Lord, what are you doing? I came from a church that had almost 400 people to a church that had 20. I'm like, uh-uh. And that was part of my own maturity that had to be developed. I went in there thinking, they always told me it was a baby Norfolk up there. And when I walked up, I was like, no more like a fetus Norfolk. <laughs> it was not a baby. It was like in the first trimester. It was not. And just to be real with you guys, it was a struggle. And the people didn't respect us. We weren't well received. To the point my wife was like, I'm coming back to Norfolk. These folks don't honor you. They don't respect us. And then I began to pray and ask God, Lord, why am I here? And he says, did I not open this door for you? I said, but Lord, like, I mean, I know I wanted more of you, but like, I, I didn't think it was going to be this. And it was like so quickly, it reminded me of the parable of the master who gives the five talents, the two talents, and the one talent. And he asked me, what are you going to do with this talent? And I had to wrestle with that because that talent was a small talent. But I realized, okay, Lord, you're right. I can't expect to be given something big because I wasn't ready for it. See, I, I, I had the calling, and I know he had given me the gifting. And sometimes your gifting can get ahead of your maturity to the point where you can fall if you're not careful. That's why the Bible is very specific on who you should call as an elder, someone who's not a new Christian, someone who is of one wife, one who's not drunk off wine, who handles his finances, a man of one home who takes care of his family and affairs. It's specific. Why? Because you can easily be set up to fail. And I began to understand, all right, Lord, I am going to work this talent and I'm going to work this talent so that I have something to give to you. And by the grace of God, he began to grow that. But through that, he was also developing me maturity because I understood now what ministry was. It wasn't all about the numbers. It wasn't all about that. It was about the people and their souls and meeting their needs. God called us to go out there and meet the needs of the people, not mine, not my ego. And these gifts are given by God. And God began to just pour his gifts. And I just kept on giving them right back out and helping. And this is what Christian maturity looks like. It develops over time. We get off that milk to get on the meat. In verse 13, I mean, chapter 13 is what holds it all together. Remember I talked about the sandwich? So chapter 12 is giving us all these gifts. He's saying, hey, you have so many of them. But let's turn to chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. And now he's going to say here, this is the reason why I give you these gifts. But if you don't operate in these gifts in this manner, then what's the point of me giving you more gifts or even developing them? He says, if I speak in the tongue of men and angels... But not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Ruling, ruling. And if I have prophetic powers and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge and all faith, so as to remove mountains, but not have love, I am nothing. Right. Nothing. And if I give away all I have, and if I am delivered up my body to be burned up, but not have love, I gain nothing. And then he goes on to say, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own ways. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. All things, it is always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Love never ends. And then we jump down to verse 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. So ask yourself, when Jesus walked this earth and operated in all the gifts did he not have this main glue, this, the meat in the middle, love? Can you imagine this right here where it says here, if Jesus didn't have the prophetic powers, if he didn't have all these things, oh, I'm sorry, he had all of them, but it's saying when he, if he didn't have love, if he didn't have kindness, can you imagine if Jesus walked around boasting and envying of others? Can you imagine if Jesus walked around arrogant and rude? It'll be hard to follow him. It'll be hard to call him Lord. That's the difference between him and us. He operated this way. 
Yet some of us sometimes, let's be real, if we're, if we're going to be real here tonight, we don't always operate in patience and kindness. We don't always treat people the way they should be treated. We can be rude. We can be arrogant. We can be resentful at times because why? We're selfish by nature. And the Holy Spirit has to be the one that develops that in our hearts to take that selfishness out. And that's when maturity comes in. We want the giftings, but God's like, I can't give it to you yet because you're not ready for it. You're not. And tonight, we have to understand there are different gifts, but the same fruit. The fruit comes from the Spirit. And you look at all of this here, and we have to operate within the fruit of the Spirit. And when we do that, these giftings come more natural. And this is why I want to help us all here, because Galatians talks about that in Galatians 5, 12, 22, about all the fruit. And with all of that, all of us as Christians should operate that way. That's baseline. If you're thinking to yourself, man, but Lord, I want to do, are you, are, you, are you operating in the fruit of the Spirit? Is there one little piece that's missing? Because if it is, we need to get that right before we do the other things. Because we can look at all these things and yet wonder why we're not seeing results. We're wondering why we're not seeing the church grow. Because we're not operating the way Christ operated. We're not operating the way Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling us, the church, to operate in. Do I get it right all the time? No, as your pastor, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't. But I'm so grateful that I still hear the Holy Spirit that when he tells me, what are you doing? I'm quick to say, Lord, I'm sorry. And then I make right with those who I've wronged because I understand that the enemy can easily come in here and counterfeit. But now that we know that, that these gifts are available for us, but we need to operate in love. Look at what he says here now in chapter 14. And this is where now we see the public display of our gifts and the private display of these gifts because there's a difference between the two we have the public worship and we have the private worship okay because there's an order to things we don't want to come out here and just do crazy stuff right there's churches out here that man they got snakes in the back and they're ready to pull them out right and we're ready to go out here and cast out devils and crawl all over the floor here and do all this crazy stuff i've seen that and they've taken it so far the other way and and paul says be careful you don't get to that place now, can I just say real quick, because I, I don't want to be caught and be blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's the only one that's unforgivable. God may have used that one time, okay? I'm not saying that God could not have used a snake or something of that nature. So I don't want to be one that's coming out here and, 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 and raining on their parade. But I don't think that was something that was called to do all the time. And I, I know this for a reason, because on the way home from church on Sunday, my daughter goes to me, Dad, you know that in the Bible, Moses used a serpent on a stick? And people were healed when they looked at it. And I'm like, man, praise God to the kids' church worker. Shout out to you guys, by the way. So we started talking about that, right? My man over there, let's go. You were there in the class? All right, Daniel was like, yeah, I was there. <laughs> um, and I'm listening. So we're having this conversation. I'm like, praise God. She knows this word. You know, she took me to the scripture. I went to the Old Testament. She's like, no, Dad, it's in the New Testament. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. So we took it to the New Testament. And I said, yes. You know, I said, but now we have one that's greater than the serpent. And his name is Jesus. And he was high and lifted up. And his blood now is what gives us the healing and what sets us free. But it's amazing to have this conversation with a seven-year-old. Now, can God use the serpent again? Yes, but Jesus is greater than the serpent. So that's why I say I don't want to sit there and rain on those parades. But look at what he says here. The one who speaks in tongues builds up himself. All right, I'm going to stop there for a second. I love to sing and worship the Lord. I do it all the time. I was doing it here on Night of Worship the other day, and I was butchering the, 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 the lyrics, and my wife was like, you ain't even singing the right lyrics. And I said, well, who are you to judge me? That's how it should have been written. Right? Now, if I would have came up here and saying, y'all would be like, please take the microwave, microphone from him, he don't need to be doing that. But can I ask you, do you think my father in heaven was pleased with my worship? Yeah. He was pleased with my worship because there's a type of worship that should be done in private. And I think what I was doing probably should have been done in private because it wasn't a gift for everyone to have and receive. It was between him and I. And trust me, my child and my wife told me about that. The noise wasn't joyfully sounding good to someone's ears, but to my ears, by the time it got through everything to the third heaven, I'm sure to Jesus's ears, it was like, who, who is that singing down there, All right? But it's not a gift for everybody. Can I be real? 
I'm just saying something. I'm going somewhere with this, you guys. But when I study the word of God, and God speaks to me to bring this word to you, it wouldn't do any good if I just kept it to myself. It's a gift that I need to give to you publicly. So certain gifts are to be given and used publicly to build us up. And he says here, the one who speaks in tongues builds up himself. Now, there's a place and a time in the church where we do this. But for the most part, praying in your heavenly language is something that we should do in private. Now, if we do it publicly and the spirit of God does allow that to happen, there should be an interpretation for it. Because there's an order to how things God does it. And this is why he says, hey, these are the gifts. This is how we do it. And then, hey, this is how it looks publicly and privately. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. So this is where the gifts of knowledge and uh, revelation come out. And someone teaches and you receive it and you are edified. Then we're going to jump down to verse 17. If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? So the gift has to be used. I can have a gift, but if I don't use it, how do we know what the gift is? So there's a time and a place for it publicly and privately. We need to see what those gifts are so that we can give them and use them for the building of his church. You know, I can have this piano. It's a great piano sitting right there. But it's not doing anything unless someone who knows how to play it plays it. And this is where the gifts come out. That's why it's important that if we have a gift, we use the gift and continue to develop it. Because if not, that's just a piano sitting there not doing anything and blessing anyone. You sitting on your hands when you have a gift and you're not using it, it's just like that piano sitting right there. It's beautiful to look at. It's nice, but it's so much better when it's being played with the good note, by the way. Not just banging on it. And that's where we have to come into it. Verse 12, since you are eager for manifestations of the spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. You want these things? Cool. Desire them. Go after them. But make sure you go after them to build up the church. Verse 17, I'm just skipping down a little bit here. For many may be given thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. So make sure that you're using it to build up and not for yourself. If you have a certain gift where it's putting people down, you're not building others up, it's not good. That's why he says, look, we give thanks to God because he's the one who gives us the gifts, but it's not for us to push people down, but it's to build them up. Verse 20, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. God wants us to be mature, to grow, to develop, not to sit down. When we sit, we're not growing, we're not developing, we're just stagnant. Move around, get around, meet with some people, get into a small group, serve, you know, go out and and, and go into the community, share your faith. These are the type of things that build up. And then he jumps down to verse 40. But all things should be done decently and in order. See, when you were a child, you were selfish. Put two two two-year-olds in a room with one toy and watch how quickly they're going to go into a fight because they're not mature. Two adults with one item or whatever, they're mature enough to compromise and make concessions for one another to use it. It's the same. When you become mature, you begin to realize it's not about you. It's about others. And God brings in the lost. He brings in the broken every week into this church. The question is, are we coming in here with all of our baggage, all of our brokenness, expecting to be met and our needs all fixed up by God when God's like, You are mature. You've been walking me for a while. Like, you need to get yourself together so that you can help these out because the church is all jacked up and it's never going to come to the point where it's going to operate the way it needs to until the body figures it out. And this is where we need to understand that we develop our giftings. Don't just desire a gift just so that you can walk around and say, I have it. Desire the gifts that you can build others. If it's a gift that should be used in private, use it in private. Build yourself up so that when you come in here, you can use the gifts that God wants you to use publicly so that others can benefit from that. Because he wants to do a work. And this is where it's important that you find leaders who can help you. That's why I say get involved. Be a part of a small group being part of a serve team because there are leaders who are there who will do life with you, who will see something in you that will help you develop, that will help you grow so that you can become fully matured. The Bible says that we are called to build up the church, to equip the saints for the what? 
work of the ministry. I get it. Trust me, when I got saved, I wanted all the Holy Ghost bumps, goosebumps. I wanted to feel it. I wanted to be slayed in the spirit for the whole service. And it was just being selfish. I just wanted to lay down. Let's be real. I mean, the first time I got it, man, God gave me that, and I felt it. After that, it was like, all right, you expect it all the time. And God's like, look, it's not about you. Stop being selfish. I want to do something in someone else's life, and you're running up here every single time. How about you use what I gave you and give it to someone else? That's what we need to get to the point where we are now pouring ourselves out. And like I said Sunday, we don't come in here empty. And I pray you guys understand when I say don't come in here empty because God wants you to be in fellowship with him all week long, not just on Sundays and not just on Wednesdays. Because when we do that, we'll begin to develop and grow. We begin to hear his voice and we'll begin to walk out the giftings he has for us. We want to live a spirit-filled life. We need to get together with the one who has the spirit to give us every day. Every day. My kids come down every morning. Dad, what are we eating for breakfast? Dad, what are we eating for dinner? Why? Because they know that I am the one who provides the meal. They don't ask their other siblings, hey, what are we having for food? Because they know they're not the ones who give it. It's the same thing. If we know that he's the one who has the bread of life, then we should come to him every day seeking the goodness of God, tasting and seeing that he is good. And when you see him with a contrite heart, he will fill you. Fill you up so that you can be poured out as a drink offering. So that's part two to this.